Blondu, new product manager of Eternity Systems, and Rowan Blizzard, product manager and solutions seeker from Innovation House Australia, spoke to our Thrive community about how industries can innovate to reduce their impact on the environment. Their talks were part of July's SDG9 theme on industry, innovation and infrastructure. After their presentation, our speakers kindly took questions from the audience. Thanks a lot for both the speakers to enlightening us in this evening with your thoughts on innovation. There are quite many questions which has come up. So I will take a first question to Eleonora. So the first question is uh, asked, Eleonora, do you see industry reducing the global supply chain links or diversifying these links to be more resilient? So this is the question asked to Eleonora. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, the, the, I'm really convinced that the reindustrialization um, that has started since the uh, sanitary um, crisis um, all over the world and us in Europe, we even have uh, the UK and war. So it's really, uh, an active uh, an active move now uh, in uh, in our continent to try to reloc re relocation our industry but also to uh, maybe reduce certain production we had and that was not really necessary and to focus on the necessary ones um and the, so there are dif different uh, social impact the first ones is um, are the, that industry cannot be made in Paris or in Berlin. <laughs> uh, that has to to be made within the territories, and um, is um, that that is really impactful because um, for the last fifty years, as we mainly were oriented to digital and services uh, activities, we focused on um, capitals and big cities to develop services and um, that, wow, that, that are important and needed, but have less sometimes um, real impact in the real society. Um, that it's good for finance, uh, for the flows of finance and etc. Uh, but when you really look at the real impact on the real society on the, of, of our daily life, uh, sometimes it's not uh, clear what it is. Uh, rather than with industry, it is within the territories because we need to put the factories somewhere and it takes place uh, in, I don't know if it's an in France, but I, I think it is on in France for now. Um, we have the ZAN, uh, which is a new law because we know we like to make law in France. Uh, it's called, um, so zero artificial a zero art artific artificialization net of our territories. That is an objective for the next few years uh, that we do not put new buildings or whatever on actual um, grass or uh, how we call this, um, on places that are now for agriculture and uh, for the food, um, we cannot, uh, for the, in, in, within the next two years, we, we won't be able to industrialize and artificialize um, digital places. Uh, so it's a challenge because we have to reindustrialize, but we cannot expand the size and the impact of our artificialization of the ground. And, uh, um, but I think it's a good challenge because um, many um, industrial uh, old places, uh, rather than to upgrade them and to make them uh, again reusable and uh, to rehabilitate them, we were used to say, okay, it's not uh, nice anymore. I will build a new one here. It's easier. It's uh, quicker, it's uh, less uh, cost expensive. Um, so we, it will force us all to really optimize all the square meters we have. And in terms of uh, finally, finally of optimization of all the, 
the space we have um, within the territories and the cities, it's a good challenge to have. And um, also, it really, um, it, it will be through the territories. Uh, but also, we also need to reconnect the industries to the citizens, because as we were having the mind of industries is bad, is, is dirty, it's noisy, and etc. We used to put the industries um, far, far, far away from the cities. Uh, but actually, the new industries are less um, have less negative impact, uh, even if it's not perfect, of course. But really, you can almost sometimes have a you have the factory next to your house, and you won't even have some bad uh, impact of this. Of course, it's not all. But uh, now there are some factories you don't even know that, that are factories. So, and also the, as employees, you have new needs. Uh, you want to go to your job uh, by bicycle or by public transport. Uh, you don't want to use uh, your car for everything you do. Uh, so it's really fascinating because the public uh, communities have to really take the roles they have, and they forgot for the 50 years, the roles they have to organize the territory to make industry, people, and uh, leisure and everything we need uh, at uh, in coherence to work all together. And uh, it really developed and it's really also answering new social needs of uh, new generation and matching ecological transition also we need. Um, so yeah, to re-industrialize and to understand that circular impact is at every step of your project. And I really speak of project and not product. Um, it really helps you to take in account the territory you are in, the people you will interact with, and how to co-build co and co-develop all together the new organization of the ecosystems. Thank you, Eleonora. So the next question is to Rowan. So the question asked is here, Rowan, and many thanks for your excellent presentation. You started with the crucial insight that innovation starts from within. This suggests a powerful understanding that innovation is potentially fundamental change at both individual and community levels. If so, what do you see as the major forces and in influences driving positive individual and community innovation? Yeah, uh, thanks for a very good question. Of course, um, each of us have our own challenges that arise that get us to stimulate and start thinking about uh, making change and, and <clears throat> hopefully some of that becomes innovative. And without getting too uh, far ahead, I think across the world we're seeing a, <clears throat> a lack of faith. We used to blindly follow um, uh, re uh, uh, royalty or governance, thinking that they had our best interests at heart and they would that they would solve it, and we could be subservient to their leadership, and their leadership would uh, see us through no matter what. And clearly, uh, at varying levels, we're getting this realization that that's perhaps not been entirely correct, and that perhaps we need to take some of our own responsibility for our outcomes whether this is individually, family, state, country, whatever, you know, however we want to divide these groups up. And some of those realisations are really, really uncomfortable. So uh, I'm convinced that a lot of people will stop. I don't want to know anymore. It's uncomfortable. Um, and, hey, how about them cowboys? And talk about whatever the other flippant trivial safe conversation is but i think generally there is enough of that awareness in society generally um, and 
perhaps we're seeing that, you know, we might point to that in examples in election results or um, <clears throat> tribalism, um, particular personalities that have, have achieved leadership roles that you think that person clearly struggles to do up their shoes. How do they get to that role there? Um, so I think the outcome is with all of those variety of challenges apparent, um, some people are certainly looking internally and saying, hey, maybe I need to take responsibility for my own outcomes as well. I can't hand it all over to the government to do that. Uh, Thank you, Roland. I'm sure it's a I'm sure it's a challenging question for everybody to individually answer. Sure. Thanks, Roland. So the next question is to Eleonora. Many thanks, Eleonora, for your excellent and informative presentation. Just wondering whether in terms of sustainable development goal nine, we might see inclusive and sustainable industrialization as being a contradiction in terms. That is, there are different and contradictory forces driving inclusivity and sustainability on the one hand and industrialization on the other hand. Or do you see innovation as a way of bringing these two forces into greater alignment and synergy? Um, yeah, it's what I, I was saying and uh, what I wanted to say, of course, um, I don't know if it is the same across all the countries of the world, but um, as uh, in Europe, uh, we deindustrialized for the last 50 years uh, and we focused on cities and services. Uh, the rate of, um, um, how you call this, sorry, uh, the rate of, oh yeah. The rate of uh, unemployment uh, has raised a uh, lot in territories. Uh, so thanks to industries, this, hopefully will, uh, dec will decrease. And uh, I'm, as I was saying also during the presentation, um, to reindustrialize is not to just take the industry of, of 50 years ago and to recreate it now. And it's not also to take the, the factories we put in Asia to put them back in Europe. No, it, we have to reinvent a new way of industrialization, um, we have to um, uh, to think also about um, the social context uh, of our countries. Uh, for example, uh, in Europe, it's really difficult to recruit technicians of, or, or operators or for for two reasons. First, the jobs, uh, even with robotics. Uh, are still not this, uh, the more um, uh, inspirational job you can find when you look for a job. Um, even, and we have to say that thanks to robotization, uh, there are really less harder than they used to be. Um, and for example, in the company I work for, in Eternity System, we have operators that are here as, are in the company for the last 20 years. And we, uh, implemented robotization at every step of the supply chain. So that made them to, uh, the, the job evolved and uh, they are still here. Uh, we didn't stop to recruit. Um, we just made them job evolved uh, to new responsibilities. They are not doing the task. They are controlling the machine that is doing the task. Uh, and it's uh, less uh, difficult for them. Also, um, as we are facing a large uh, human recruitment uh, challenges and uh, problem, um, also because for the last 10 years, we developed um, web, digit, web developer factories, as I was saying, we, we, had a, we have now a thousand of schools developing web developers, uh, but we, we completely lost the, um, the schools of craftsmen and women and uh, that people that use their hands and they, they know uh, how to do uh, things with their hands. I don't know how to say English. Um, so we, we, and that's why 
for example, in France, but I know it's uh, the tendency in Europe. Um, we we are now going to recreate schools of craftsmen and women, but including at the same time the manual expertise and the robotics expertise mm -hmm. to take the best of them to make the job less difficult in terms of physical needs and at the same time to use the robotics as a an help and not a goal that is really important robotics and technology should be an help and not a goal um, that's really a key in our re-industrialization um, for example if i take this example that is a, a bit political uh, touchy uh, we want all to well, we want the politics wants to to develop the 5G all over the world, uh, but actually, who needs the 5G? Uh, I think the 5G is needed in the industry, that's right, for some sectors, for example, in automobile uh, needs. But us as consumer and citizen, actually with the 4G, maybe it's enough. Uh, and in France, for example, there are even some region, as I am now, as you can see, I'm in my cars because if I go one kilometer away from where I'm, I am, I have not connection at all. So before going to 5G, maybe we should start with 3 and 4G everywhere and then see if we need 5G as consumer. Um, 5G, I'm sure, is really key in some industry for some needs, but that's why we have to think in terms of needs and not in terms of technology, is where is the need for which technology and not which technology we will create needs for. No, it's uh, which needs, which solution. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm convinced about the role of innovation through design approach, the so design thinking approach, actually. Um, so design thinking is really a user-centric approach and also a collaborative approach with all the partners of the project to be sure to have the right solution at the right place at the right time. And um, also it helps to um, improve the acceptation of the solution uh, when you co-developed with uh, all the partners. Uh, when I say partners, it can be the final consumer, it can be the community, it can be the industrial. Um, so yeah, it really has uh, this, innovative approach based on design thinking and uh, inspired from circular industry, um, really developed new industry adapted for the 50, for the next 50 years. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced it's uh, the right way to do it. Uh, we, we, it's just not, it's just not uh, we move a factory from here to there and uh, no, we really have to reinvent taking in account the social so in terms of working condition of uh, of the, the sometimes we lost also uh, competencies and skills uh, so how to do without it or how to help uh, thanks to robotics how to maybe uh, adapt uh, to without it um, we also have to relearn some uh, skills we lost and um, and also, of course, we taking in account the ecological transition we we need. So yeah, with the design thinking approach uh, and innovation, uh, we will build a new collaboration uh, within the society in terms of global. Thank you, Ulmora. <clears throat> so the next question is to Rowan. So thank you for your insightful thoughts. I absolutely agree that a modern society can easily create sustainable living conditions without overconsumption. Eco-friendly home products in combination with the strategies mentioned could even stimulate sustainable transition way faster. Now, how fast is this achievable in a society or will it take a longer period of time? That is the first question. And also there is a second part to it. Mm. I would be pleased if you mention again the name of the research 
you have mentioned in the beginning regarding schools and grass. Okay. Um, uh, so the the ability to transition quickly, and we've seen this already around the world, that when enough community desire arises, that governments are overthrown, directions are changed quite rapidly. Uh, so, which makes me hopeful that um, we don't necessarily have to do that, but uh, we have that ability to be agile, quick, responsive, and humans are incredibly adaptable. Uh, so thinking about housing as my space and, and expertise and in so-called developed uh, economies around the world, there is a a crazy situation of a lot of homelessness and housing unaffordability and people excluded from even reasonable levels of housing. Now that can be quite easily changed. Uh, in Australia, for example, there's a million vacant properties today and there's about half a million vacant people. Oh, sorry, about half a million homeless people. So it seems to be a very simple fix. The, the challenge is we don't have the uh, decision, the human desired decision to make that change. Now, some of those houses might not be the right location, they might be run down, they might need a coat of paint and all these other stories, but fundamentally, there's more than enough housing sitting vacant today for the people who need to occupy it. And how we occupy it, might, we not, might need to do that slightly differently to how we imagine occupying housing today, but that's only adjusting our thinking. It's not we have to rebuild millions of homes or anything crazy like that. Now, the powerful part is if we do that well, we have much more diverse and integrated and inclusive communities that are a much more friendly, open, happy place to live. Um, so some of that will be um, cranky white old Anglo-Saxon blokes or in this cranky old white Anglo-Saxon bloke corner. And um, if you want someone who's old and crotchety and, and can bang things with a hammer, um, go and see them. But if you want another group of people, there'll be other people thrive and survive and do really well in communities because they're allowed to flourish in different ownership models. So... Um, I think it actually can be a very rapid response. I'm trying to have conversations with slow thinking, old term government institutions that are, that are thinking about, well, we need to spend billions of dollars and build bricks and mortar. The challenge is they don't need to spend billions of dollars and build bricks and mortar. They need to reimagine how people occupy housing and then respond to that. Because they're not having that um, conversation, they are using you know, a 1980s, 1990s response to a 2022 problem. So that can change really rapidly and really quickly. I'm not specifically sure if I quoted education as a piece for the second question, but the uh, lawn reference. This writer is a pretty amazing writer. And in his first chapter of this particular book, um, he covers off the uh, lawn specific um, evolution where it started from a royalty and a, uh, having a largesse of um, employed labor or surf labor and water resource and you know, yard space to make a lawn. And uh, he does go on in quite a bit of detail about the psychology behind that because for everybody in the world who's aspired to have a lawn, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know if you've actually tried playing a game of cricket on a lawn. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy surface to play cricket on. So why would you do it? Um, there's much more practical uh, surfaces and, and solutions out there. 
but the lawn has this um, psychological solution as showing off um, wealth and, and uh, potential. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Rowan. So the next question is to Eleonora. So it is regarding the nudge and the awareness, which you have mentioned. So in the US, there are nudges used as babies' photographs on the shop's wall, not to break into. So is nudge and awareness programs, which are conductor, are do they same or is it different? Could you throw some lights on nudge? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I have understood the question. So the question is, in the US, there are nudges. I think nudges are used. Uh, so babies' photographs are there on the walls of the shops where there are glasses. So nobody can break through because of the nudge thing. Now, is the nudge and the awareness program are same, the effect of both are same, or which is easier to do or implement in the society? So could you throw some light on nudge? Yeah, the, the nudge is actually used for years in marketing approach. Uh, for yeah. example, in the public transport, um, when um, the train company uh, put the, um, wait, um, the arrow in a w one direction on another. Um, for example, they can, when you, there's a train opens the door in front of you, they, if they want you to make sport and to, um, um, how to say, um, I, wait, sorry. I, um, and to alleviate the numbers of people going in one direction compared to another one. For example, when you, in front of the door, they will put the normal stairs and they will write, yes, you lost one calorie. Yes, you lost two calories. Yes, you lost three calories. This is a nudge. Uh, and sometimes they will put the arrows uh, for the electronic uh, stairs. Uh, but at the back, it's because they, want to encourage you to take the normal stairs and not the electronic ones. Uh, or when you are in a festival, for example, um, which international example I can use. Uh, for example, when there is, um, oh, I lost my word this morning, sorry. Uh, an ashtray, they will put uh, two football teams um, that are in competition and they will ask you, are you more for the first one or the second one? And you, so you will put your cigarette but uh, in one or another. But actually, they actually really don't care of your choice. Is that what they want is that you don't put your cigarette butt on the ground. So the nudges are really used for years if we were in your life. But as they are um, comportmental biases, you don't feel them, you don't see them, but you are, we are nudging, we are nudging all the time. Um, um, yeah, we are nudging all the time. And uh, for example, in my uh, machine, uh, I built ClinCup. Um, I wanted people to understand the use of this machine by its external design. The, and it was, it was a new machine, a new one, uh, there is no comparative machine machines in the world. So we work on the design on how we can make people understand what is the role of this machine without putting uh, explanation around the machine. Because for the beginning, of course, you can have some explanation, but then when you produce thousands of the machines, you cannot put each time uh, a roll up next to the machine explaining how to use it. Uh, when, when we send you a new product, we not always uh, give you uh, the notice with the product. We, you have to guess how to use a product when you see it. So we worked with a de industrial designer. Um, so always the, the role of design 
design thinking and industrial design is key because it's always user centric and not technology centric. It's user centric. And um, so we work on the design on how this machine can be understandable by everyone, even a kid, and make people okay to have a deposit system. Because five years ago in France, um, people were, were saying, deposit is shit, is complicated, we don't want to use deposit. That was the first uh, thing. And the second one was, I don't want to drink in, uh, in the cup of my colleague, it's disgusting. I was like, okay. And when you, when you go to the swimming pool, where do you put your stuff? In a little box when you have a, a one euro or a one dollar deposit, right? So you already do it. Or when you go to Walmart, you have uh, your trolley and you put one euro or one dollar inside as well. So you're already doing deposit system. So why not in, for your coffee time? And for the second argument, I was going to say, I was saying, well, when you go to the restaurant, you're even eating in the same plate of thousands of people you don't know, and you're still eating in it, right? So it is the same. Uh, it's not a, a large washing machine. It's all minimized, minimal, minimalized uh, in the machine, and uh, you don't see it, but it's the same concept. So in terms, the marketing is taking more and more, more and more and more importance in the acceptations of the innovations and the pedagogical approach we have to, exp to, to explain people the new way to consume. And to that's why I'm, I'm, I'm often saying that now marketing is not uh, one, um, two plus one. Uh, well, if you buy two, you have one. No, it's more if you buy this, you will save the planet because of this. Uh, so now marketing is not like promotional, it's more pedagogical than promotional. And it's really the key for the customer to integrate and accept um, the product, the innovation, and what is coming with it is the factory. So really the role of marketing is, no more, is more to educate than to sell. And if the consumer un understand uh, the ecological and social impact of the project that is presented, uh, they will accept it and even then become ambassador of it. So yeah, first for the question about nudge, we are already nudged, nudged uh, all the time. Uh, we just, we don't know about it. Uh, and the second is the role of marketing is key uh, to our society transition we need to do. Thank you, Eleonora. Uh, the last question towards Rowan, because we are running short of time, that's why. So the question is, <clears throat> complexity of daily life grew as days pass by. In such a scenario, will people or the community be ready to accept the idea of simplicity in terms of reflect, share? Will the people accept this or the community will accept this? It's to Rowan. Yeah, I, I guess um, the answer is I don't uh, expect everybody to follow any particular one answer. Um, and I think the answer is a diverse response. So some people will. Some people will willingly share, reduce their impact, have a less complex life. And if you've ever been under a starry night with no phone signal, some crackling of the wood burning, a bit of smoke drifting into the sky, sitting back with no connection to any other human, and you go, this is pretty idyllic, idyllic. Now, maybe I don't live all my life like that, but each of us can get into that connection quite quickly. That crackle of a fire, a cool starry night, looking up and counting stars, do I need complexity? Do I need the big house? Do I need multiple, you know, levels of, of uh, complexity? 
not for everybody. Some people absolutely you know, feel they need to have 100 connected devices and need to be on top of 1,000 social media platforms or whatever. Um, even those examples, I think, don't take long to show up as transitory or um, a, a niche or a funny example uh, to observe someone who's following the latest um, fad diet or the social media trend. Um, but I don't think many people are following that as their whole answer. I think there's um, plenty of scope for a range of answers. I don't want everyone to follow my simple path because my campsite will be full and I don't want that. <laughs> Thank you, both Eleanor and Rowan. We have got a few more questions, but because of running short of time, we will stop here the Q&A session. Thanks to both of you for enlightening us with the innovation from different disciplines. That is something great from an economic commercial perspective and on top of that, uh, from a higher philosophical perspective. Thanks to both of you for encouraging us and stimulating us intellectually. Thanks a lot.